Morning First Baptist, I'm Julie. And I'm Valerie. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Discover First is tonight. If you'd like to learn more about First Baptist, join us from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. The Purple Holes Bluegrass Concert is also tonight at 6 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. Admission is free. You won't want to miss it. Hey, senior adults, make plans for senior adult luncheon on Wednesday, August 14th at noon in the Fellowship Hall. This will be a great time of fellowship and a delicious fish fry. The school year is here. I know I am back in my classroom and several of my teacher friends are as well. We invite you to the back to school picnic on August 14th. There will be food and games, so bring your whole family and invite your neighbors. Please bring food to share. More info can be found in the worship guide. I hope to see you there. Next Sunday is Promotion Sunday. We are showing your children their new classroom today so they know where to be dropped off next week. And we are still looking for teachers to serve in our children's ministry. It is such a joy to pour into the next generation of our church. So if you feel called to serve, contact me at jduval at fbcbolivar.org. You've been blessed, haven't you? Yes, I love serving in children's ministry and teaching my third graders. Baptism Sunday is August 18th. Are you interested in being baptized? Contact the church office or text the word CONNECT to 417-282-8322 to fill out a Baptism Connect card. FBC's Men Conference is coming up September 27th and 28th and registration opens today. Dr. Gordon Dutio will be joining us as our guest speaker and will be sharing lessons learned from scripture. Friday night's meal will be catered by Curly Cues and admission is $20. So please register at fbcbolivar.org slash events today. If this is your first time in worship with us, we invite you to text the word guest to 417-282-8322. You can also visit our info hubs or the hospitality room after the service where we can meet you and help you connect better with First Baptist. Now. Let's worship. Good morning. You might know it looks a little different up on stage today. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Julie Duvall, and I'm the uh, children's director here at First Baptist. And we get the honor and privilege today of introducing to you our newest first graders. These guys have just completed kindergarten. And as part of that, what we do here at First Baptist Church is we like to present them with their very own Bible. So they have each received an adventure Bible for them to take home with them. And what is so great about this is at this age, they're just beginning to learn to read and um, especially first grade, by the end of first grade, they're going to be such great readers. And now they have their own Bible that they can open up and just read on their own for the first time ever, maybe. So that's really exciting. Um, and I'm going to, the other reason why I love our Bible presentation is because I get to share with you who all of our wonderful kiddos are, but also what they want to be when they grow up. So I'm going to uh, present to you our class that just completed kindergarten. So right here we have Andrew Bear. Andrew would like to be a volleyball player, a sapoc to craw player, which if you're not sure what that is, it's volleyball with your feet, and a battle bot creator after giving up his basketball, tennis, and lacrosse careers. <laughs> All right, next we have Annabelle Evans. Annabelle would like to be a dentist after a long time desire to be a veterinarian. Next, we have Callie Hale, and Callie would like to be a police officer. All right, we have Eli Oldweiler, and he would like to be a baker. Next, we have Charlie Sue Walker, and she would like to be a veterinarian, but maybe a cook and or a teacher. So you still have time, Charlie Sue, to figure it out. All right. Next, we have Ella Garza, and she would like to be a veterinarian and a teacher. This is Ember Floor, and she would like to be a nurse when she grows up. This is Ezra Weaver. He would like to be a baseball player for the Royals and an Olympic runner. This is Grant Davis. He would like to be a veterinarian and a skateboarder. 
This is Hannah Smith, and she would like to be a chef. And then we have Megan Smith, and she would like to be a doctor. Let's see. We have Katie Lang, and Katie would like to be a veterinarian as well. This is Lily Riffle, and she would like to be a daycare worker and an Olympic gymnast. This is Mackenzie Plaster, and she would like to be a mom. And this is Owen Fong, and he would like to be a veterinarian for tigers, so very specialized. Okay, and then we have, last but not least, Paul Netherton, and Paul wants to be an airplane pilot when he grows up. So I'm just going to say a prayer for these guys, and then um, we're going to continue with worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of these wonderful children that you have blessed us with at First Baptist. I, I thank you for our teachers that have poured into them, and just what a joy they all are. And I pray that as they receive these Bibles, that they will begin reading them and asking questions and just growing in their faith, Lord. We pray that they will just continue to seek you in all that they do and that these Bibles can just be a part of that journey. Um, we just thank you and praise you for each of them. We know you have a plan for them and help us to come around their families and help to continue to disciple them well. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. mention <clears throat> one other thing they're going to take them back to the class so parents if you need to pick them up they are going back to the kindergarten room or you can meet them up here at the top good morning Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here. We want to welcome those who are listening on the radio or watching online as well. Let's have our reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's stand together as we sing, This is Amazing Grace. Thank 
with hymn number 104, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
the opportunity this morning to worship you with our gifts. We ask that you would bless the offering, that it would smell sweet to you, that we would offer with obedient, willing, joyful hearts, and we ask this all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.
reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's stand together as we sing, Only a Holy God. Take your Bible and join me in Proverbs 18, verses 20 and 21. Proverbs 18, verses 20 and 21. And we will also look at chapter 20, verse 15. As you turn there, the time has come 
We've talked about it. I told them that I would. I made a promise, and I announced it last Sunday. Today, in honor of our youth, and specifically the ones that I went to El Salvador with, I will do a public fit check. Now, before I do this, let me just give a little bit of context for this. In the 8 o'clock service, I actually had the students that went on the El Salvador trip come with me on the stage. But in this service, I think we only have one that's in the room, Abby Weesey. So I told her I wasn't going to single her out. She was willing to come, but I said she could just watch from there. Now, I would also say in the 8 o'clock service, I did it without explaining it, and then I explained it afterwards. But since the cat's kind of out of the bag, I'll tell you what it is and then I'll do one for you, okay? That's what we'll do. That's how we'll proceed this morning. By the way, I've been much more nervous about this this week than I ever am about preaching a sermon. I don't know what that says. So what is a fit check? Well, essentially, you have to give an inventory of every article of clothing and the accessories that you're wearing. Thus, it is an outfit check or, Mike, a fit check. Now, the other part of this is when I was in El Salvador, they practically made me do this every morning, and then they rate you on it on a scale from 1 to 10. Abby, this morning, they gave me a 9.7. It's the highest I've ever had. So, here we go. You get to see one live in living color. I will do my best and see if I don't mess it up. All right. We will start with my shoes. My shoes are Steve Madden's, and they are from a mall in Metairie, Louisiana. My socks, which I'm sure you're all excited to see, are actually from the sock shop ordered off of Amazon. My pants are from Old Navy. My belt is a Levi belt from Target. My undershirt, which you cannot see, is George's from Walmart. Strangely enough, both my button-up and my coat are both J. Farrar, but from different places. The shirt is actually from J.C. Penney. The coat is also from Target. All right, let's go through my accessories now. Let's begin with what's in my right pocket, because you get in trouble for this as well if you don't mention it. Car keys for both my car and my wife's car got points taken off this morning because I didn't say which ones. So my car is a 2011 Chevy Traverse. My wife's is a 2023 GMC Acadia. In this pocket, yes, it's my cell phone. And the cell phone itself is from Target. The case, however, is ordered off of Amazon. All right. On my left wrist is my Apple iWatch, also from Target but the band is also ordered from Amazon. On my right wrist are two bracelets. One is Metanoia bracelet from the Metanoia Youth Camp in El Salvador. The other is a bracelet that says Jesus that was given to me by Smashy, one of our youth, but it was actually made out of Jed, our youth minister's bracelet kit. All right, I think I'm doing pretty well so far. All right, wedding ring, because I've missed that one before too and then gotten in trouble with Miss Holly, so I'm not going to do it today because Kenley will tell on me, is from Sissy's Log Cabin in Pine Bluff, Arkansas on the occasion of our wedding, June 2nd, 2001. And uh, my microphone, which I also missed earlier this morning, I have no idea what brand it is, but it is from our sound booth upstairs here at First Baptist Bolivar. In my right eye is a uh, contact that's of the power of negative 2.5 from Bolivar Eye Care, and there is no contact in my left eye because it's for reading and seeing up close. And finally is my hair gel, which is also ordered from Target. You have now seen a fit check. <laughs> Abby, how did I do? Okay, what would you have given me? Okay, she would have given me a 9.7. So what's the big deal about that? Well, essentially, right, it's just words. I'm, I'm just saying words. But it's amazing when I told them I would do it, how excited my words made them. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll go a step further. Most of the youth never spoke a word to me until I went to El Salvador with them. 
But after doing this every day, since we've come back, I can't get them to stop talking to me. Uh, especially Stella Scalden, who you probably need to mention that too. It is amazing, and we get this, the power of words in people's lives. We get the power of words in our own lives, but we also understand the power that words can have in other people's lives, don't we? As a matter of fact, you've probably all heard and maybe even used the modern-day proverb, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. Do you know why we say that? We say it because we don't believe it, and it's absolutely not true. We understand words can and often do harm us. As a matter of fact, often when we say that, it's because we are in the middle of deep harm that has been caused to us personally by words. In some ways, words are far more powerful than sticks and stones. But I want you to consider for a moment, as Christians, as believers, it absolutely matters how we employ, how we use our words. As a matter of fact, our words can create tremendous realities in situations in people's lives. So for just a moment, we do want to look at what does God's wisdom have to say to us about what we should do and how we should use our words and the type of power or what they produce in people's lives. So think of it this way. I want us to consider the question, what type of power is it that we wield simply with the mere possession of words. With that in mind, I want us to consider three truths this morning, and the first one we will actually see in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 15. Listen to what we read in Proverbs 20, verse 15. There is gold and abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. The first truth that I want you to see is the pre precious pricelessness of the tongue. The precious pricelessness of the tongue. Just a conservative count and consideration of the book of Proverbs yields to us no less than 90 statements concerning our words and the use of the tongue in the book. As a matter of fact, the subject of speaking or using our tongue is spoken of in the book of Proverbs far greater than any other topic. This includes our finances, our intimacy with our spouse, and even our family. As you think about that number of statements in the book of Proverbs concerning our tongue or words, I do not have time, nor do you want me to try to cover all 90 of them. <laughs> Instead, what we'll do is what we've been doing over the last several sermons, taking a broad look at the overall point or the most significant point that the book makes about the particular subject. And we want to do that today as well. Before we look at a very specific passage, which is unusual today, we do have a specific passage to look at. So before we look at Proverbs 18, verses 20 and 21, which is the passage in question, I want us to look at this verse, which gives us a broader understanding of how God's wisdom sees the value of the tongue. In other words, in this verse, we see just how precious or valuable our words are. Here again what we read in this verse. There is gold and abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. It's amazing. Normally, when we think about our words, we think about the negative effect of them. When I say something like they're valuable or it's priceless that we actually have language, your initial reaction may be that's not true. Our words, in some ways, we might see more as a disadvantage 
than an advantage. But I want you to look at what this says here. I think the reason that's the case is because we normally think about the misuse of our words or the harm that our words bring. But here again what this, word, what this, what this passage teaches us. And by the way, implied in this verse is the idea that the fact that we possess what we might call complex or detailed language is a gift, is a blessing. Here we're told that it's, it's more precious than gold and more costly than precious stones. Now think about that for a moment. The overall context of this verse is this, and I don't want you to miss it. Within the context of the book of Proverbs, the idea is sound judgment or wisdom, and specifically God's wisdom is more valuable than gold and more precious than costly stones that we might decorate ourselves with. Now, in some ways, we know that to be true. In our culture, that's true. We would say that's true. God's wisdom is rarer and more valuable than any monetary amount we could accumulate or anything that we could use for ornamentation in our life. If it's true for us, how much truer is it for the ancient Hebrew culture? But if we take a step back and we see there is a more specific context to this verse, it's not just wisdom or sound judgment in general. But it's the person that will bring you sound judgment or wisdom. The lips that bring you sound judgment. The lips that give you wisdom are more valuable than gold and rarer than precious stones. Well, how is that the case? Well, we all know how hard it is to speak truth into people's lives, especially when we know they don't want to hear it. Think about that for a moment. How rare is that? The person, for your good, knowing that you're not going to like it, is willing to speak God's wisdom into your life. Normally what happens is we understand that that might mean that somebody might not like us very much. They might think we're unloving or it might ruin a friendship. Because that, the person or the lips that will give you this truth according to God's Word is priceless and rare. Perhaps it's so priceless or precious because it is so rare. But I want you to notice, you might say, this doesn't say anything specifically about value of words. But think about this for a moment. How does wisdom or sound judgment get transferred to someone, from someone else to us? What's the only way that it can come to us? Words. So without words, without language, what the Bible here is saying is precious could never be obtained by us. You see, implied in this verse is the idea that words and language are precious. They are rare and they are valuable to us because it is through those words that we are given wisdom and sound judgment. In some ways, this could be applied to God's message of salvation. Think about this for a moment. From passages like Romans 1, we know that there are things we can learn about God from what we might call general or natural revelation. What do we mean by that? Go outside and look at creation, and whether people want to admit it or not, that lets us know that there is a creator. There is a God. It is enough to let us know that he exists. But it is not enough to actually help us to understand how it is that we can be right with that God. How it is that we can receive his salvation. No, for that, do you know what we need? It's called specific or special revelation. It is words. So when we read this passage of Scripture, we come to understand that words in and of themselves are an important, precious, dare we say, priceless commodity. This is the point. Because without them, we might miss that sound judgment. Or we would never receive that wisdom. And specifically, God's wisdom. No, it is through words that we ultimately receive God's truth. Now think about this for a moment. Often in our use or employment of words, we can be like God. We can use our words like God. You say, well, how so? 
Well, like God, we can use our words to create trust, to form relationships, to build community. But do you know what the problem is? We often use our words to do the opposite, to destroy trust, to tear down relationships, and to collapse community. We can also use our words like God by touching someone in a deep way in their soul or their heart. But the problem is often we do not use our words like God when we actually harm someone at a deep level in their heart and in their soul. We need to understand the value, yet at the same time, the power of words. So with that in mind and having considered just how priceless and precious words are, I want to ask a follow-up question. What is it that we can actually produce, good or bad, in our own life or other people's lives with our words? Well, the next two truths, the next two points that we see in this passage of Scripture or in chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, go a long way to answer that question. So I think we see an example both in our life and in other people's lives of what our words, good or bad, have the power to produce. So look with me at chapter 18, verse 20. And here's what we read there. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Notice that we don't just see the precious pricelessness of the tongue, but secondly, we see the personal produce from the tongue. Now, we all know this experientially, but did you know that your words, my words, can, 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 can actually affect my own life? My own words, positively or negatively, can, can produce things in my life. Just hear again what we read at the first part of verse 18, verse 20. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. Now, what in the world is this verse talking about? What's the context? Well, clearly in the book of Proverbs, we know that this is a metaphor. A metaphor or figure of speech is being used to make a specific or literal point. The question is, is what? Well, there's two parts of this metaphor. There's the fruits of the lip, and then there's the stomach being satisfied. The first part of this metaphor might be a little bit easier to discern than the second part. What is the fruit of someone's lips? Well, clearly, in this context, it's talking about a person's words. It's talking about your words and my words. Maybe to say it another way, I, I believe it's talking about the sum total of the effects of the words that we say. So, in other words, the results of the fruit of my lips is the results of the words that I say. That's pretty clear. But what about the stomach being satisfied? That almost seems, when we think about the stomach, to be referring to food, right? And so, is it that the, the sage here, or the author, is saying, by your words, you will either have food on the table or you won't? It's by your words that you're able to buy groceries or not? No, I don't think that's what it's saying at all. I actually think in this context here, stomach is actually metaphorically referring to someone's entire life. Stomach is representing their entire self, who they are, their life. And satisfied is referring to whether good or bad being filled up. So the idea is by the fruits of your lips, by what you say in its effect, your stomach will be filled up. That is, your entire life will be invaded by what you say. That's unavoidable. What you say will impact and invade all of who you are. Now, again, you might have a knee-jerk reaction to say, I don't know if I'd go that far. We've all experienced that at one time or another experientially, haven't we? To where our words actually filled up, became almost unavoidable in our entire life. And that's what the proverb is saying here. Your entire life will be filled up with your words. It's unavoidable, so proceed with caution. 
Now, you might find yourself saying, okay, that's great, but can you give some examples? Well, for time purposes this morning, let me give you just two ways that our words have a, a way of filling up, saturating our entire life. Here they are. One is by how much you talk. The other is by what you say when you talk. Let's start with the first one first, by how much you talk. I think the specific point of what verse 20 of chapter 18 is saying is this. Don't get too satisfied or fall in love with your own opinion too much. You see, when you start using and saying your own opinion over and over again, and you are the one that you can remember hearing the most in your own life, it is very easy to get satisfied by your own words, full of your own words because you never hear anybody else talk. That's what that's talking about. Now think about this for a moment. Don't you dare answer this out loud. Can you think of anybody like that? <laughs> by the way, certainly don't say it if it's me that you're thinking of. You ever know anybody that, that, is, that is so enthralled with their own opinions? It's the only one they care about hearing is their own. You know anybody like that? By the way, by the way, here's the harder question. Can you ever be like that? I can. And the problem is you, you think back and the only person you can remember here talk is yourself. The only opinion you can remember is your own. Now, what's wrong with that? What's the danger of that? Well, here's what the danger of that is. You and I, because we're human, we're fallible. Our, our opinions are not always inerrant. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they have errors. But if the only one you ever hear is your own, you will begin to think you're always right, and it might lead you away from the truth. Think of it like this. The problem with this is it puts you in an echo chamber where the only person you're ever hearing is yourself. And guess what? That might actually prevent you from hearing God's truth and God's wisdom. So one of the ways that our words can fill up our own life is by how much we talk. But the other way that it can fill up our life is what we say when we do talk. Now, to, to make this point, look with me for just a moment at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. And here's what we read there. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lip, lips comes to ruin. Now, on a surface, it's essentially saying, by what we say, we can either keep ourselves out of trouble, the content of what we say keep ourselves out of trouble, or we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And a lot of times it depends on the audience. So think of it this way. Uh, a righteous person, by their good words, their life prospers. But an unrighteous person, because they're unfruitful to God, by their bad or evil words, destroys themselves. What? What might this look like? Well, I'll tell you what it's looked like in my life. It's when I've found myself being very rash. You ever been rash with a word you, you, you've said or a response you've given? You ever given a rash word in the presence of a wrong person? They ever let that go? They ever not use that as evidence against, against you? Now, think about this for a moment. The idea is in the presence of your enemy, an empty promise, an untrue assertion, or an unwise disclosure, either about yourself or someone else, can literally lead to ruin. Financially, physically, mentally, and spiritually. The idea, though, on the other side of that is, because there's a positive side as well, by our apt words, every part of our life will be satisfied. Now, for just a moment... We intuitively know this to be true, and our culture knows this to be true, that our own words produce results in our own lives. Now, why do I say that? Well, uh, let me give you this example. I hope you don't ever have the unfortunate experience of either being arrested by or investigated by the police. But if you do, before they can ask you any questions, they have to do something to you. 
Because if they don't do this and you say something, whatever you say could actually be thrown out and prove inadmissible in court. Do you know what it is that they have to do? They have to Mirandize you. They have to read you your Miranda rights. Do you know how those start? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Why is that the case? Because intuitively we understand that our own words can affect ourself, can't they? They can produce good or bad results in our life. Now there's two ways to say this, and I like the second better, but let me give you both. The idea is a person's own words should lead to fulfillment and satisfaction in their own life. But the probably better way to say it is certainly a, a person's own words shouldn't lead to lack of satisfaction and destruction in their own life. So first we see that one result, the power that our words have, are in our own life. But there's a second thing that our words can produce. Not just things in our own lives, but results in other people's lives. So I want you to look with me, if you would, back at chapter 18, verse 21. Look what we read there. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So we see not just the precious pricelessness of the tongue and the personal produce from the tongue, but finally... And perhaps most importantly, we see what I've called the profound power in the tongue. The, the tongue has a tremendous power. Our words have a tremendous power in other people's lives. So much so that the way the book of Proverbs describes it, the way God's Word says it is, the power of death and life, or death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, for a moment, you go, well, I don't know if I believe that either. Are you really telling me that the tongue has the power of death? And I would look at you and say in a very real way, yes. So there is an anecdotal story told about a young lady that I think makes this point very well. A story is told about a young lady who lived in Hollywood. And unfortunately, she got to the place where she took her own life. She committed suicide. And she left a note. We call that a suicide note. And on that note, there were but two words. But it said everything we need to know about why she got to that point. What were the two words? They said is all she wrote on her suicide note. What does that mean? It means that the power of other people's words in her life or about her took her to the point where she believed the only hope she had was to take her own life. Does the tongue have the power of death? In a very real way, yes. See, what this verse tells us is that uh, power for both good and bad lies with our words. The tongue possesses both the power of death and life. So for a moment again you say, how so? Can you give us examples? Let me quickly give you three and we'll have to look at other places in the book of Proverbs to make this point. First of all, the first way that our, our words can have power in other people's lives is it can affect other people's emotional and mental state. Where do I see that? Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. This is what we read there. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fool pours out folly. This is essentially saying, depending on what you say and who you say it to, it could have the effect of either a positive or negative mentality or positive or negative emotions. My translation does the Hebrew right here where it translates the word a harsh word, singular. Exactly what it says in Hebrew. Did you know all it takes 
is one word in the right or wrong context to make somebody angry. Think about that for a moment. We might not know the context, but one word can set somebody off. You've experienced that before, and so have I. But perhaps in the right context, said rightly, a right word can actually put somebody in a better or right frame of mind. One single word. The idea here is our words, depending on how they're used, can affect somebody mentally and emotionally. There's a second way that our words have power in people's lives. Not just their mental and emotional state, but secondly, we see that it also can affect someone's physical life. Where do I see this? Look with me, if you would, for just a moment at chapter 12. And I'm going to read verse 18 and then verse 25. Proverbs 12, 18, and then verse 25. Here's what we read there. There is one whose rash words are like, like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. Then verse 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Now, we, we do know, we've already said this, that often in the book of Proverbs or in Hebrew poetry, we, we see metaphors or hyperbole or figures of speech. I, I don't think that's the case here. I think in several places the book of Proverbs tell us what is going on mentally in someone's life or what is being said to them spiritually can and often does have physical results. Now, guys, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel that if you say or think the right thing, everything will turn out exactly like you want. I'm saying when there is a spiritual truth going on in your life, it absolutely can and often does affect you physically. And by the way, our words can impact people like that. And we see it over and over again in the book of Proverbs. I mentioned this last week, and I'll read it to you today. We see this in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Just listen to what we read here. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Listen to verse 8. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. The idea is when I do it God's way, when I seek good or righteousness and not evil, it affects me physically. And our words, when we speak truth and life to people, it can affect them physically. Now, we know this again to be true. Let me give you an example. If, if my life is not where it needs to be spiritually, if there are some things out of whack and I'm not following the Lord, you better believe it is going to affect my relationship with my wife physically. And if you've ever been in a relationship, you know that to be true. One area of our life affects other areas of our life. And our words can have that impact on people's lives. Researchers have told us this with anxiety, haven't they? We know when someone feels anxious, it doesn't just affect them mentally, does it? But anxiety has a physiological effect on our, on our bodies. We might not eat well if we're anxious, sleep well, have any energy. We might actually physically get sick from anxiety. Now, I want you to notice what we read here in chapter 12. Notice the comparison and contrast whether good or bad or negative or positive from the words that we use in other people's lives. Our positive words can have positive effects. Our negative words can have negative effects. So two ways that our words have power in other people's lives are mental and emotional and physical. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, we see that our words can affect other people spiritually, their spiritual realities. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 10, verse 21, and here's what we read there. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Now, on the surface here, you say, well, this says that uh, the, the, the lips of the wide feed many, and that sounds physical again, doesn't it? But what if I were to tell you that the word for feed here in the Hebrew is actually the word for shepherd? Because that is exactly the word that's used here. And we understand in Israel's context, and really in the Bible as a whole, this concept of shepherding went to have spiritual ramifications, doesn't it? What does it mean to shepherd someone? It means spiritually to care for them. 
to teach them, to guide them, to give them spiritual care. And we often know from his own, we also know from his own words that Jesus is the ultimate picture and fulfillment of a spiritual shepherd. He himself called himself the good shepherd, didn't he? And what does that mean? It means that he takes care of us physically. You see, our words in people's lives can affect them mentally and emotionally, physically, but most important, spiritually. You know, the greatest impact or through what it is that we can have the greatest impact in people's lives is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. How is it that we share the gospel with anybody? How is it that the gospel is shared? Well, Romans chapter 10 tells us, doesn't it? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. By the way, how is it that you heard the gospel? How is it that you received the gospel? One of my mentors said it like this. Someone told someone who 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 told you. There was a guy in church history by the name of St. Francis of Assisi, and this quote was attributed to him. By the way, we have come to believe that he actually didn't say this. This was a, a, a misattributed quote. But it's, 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 it's said that he said, share the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Now, we believe he didn't say that. But even if he did, I will tell you he was wrong. It absolutely matters how you live, but you can't share the gospel without using words. You just can't do it. You've got to use words. That is the greatest way that we can use the power of our word to impact someone else's life by doing what Jesus has called us to do, and that's sharing the gospel with them. That is the most important thing, and that's the greatest impact, the greatest power our words can have on someone's life. Jesus himself said it, didn't he? The Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've, com I've commanded, and lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. You see, we understand that God's Word remains. It changes life, and it always will. It will continue to. So we go back to our original question. What power does our words have, and why does it matter? Well, consider this statement. We must allow our tongues to be tamed by God's wisdom so that our words are instruments to build and bless rather than weapons to damage and destroy. Many of you may have never heard of or seen the 1986 cult classic, The Three Amigos. <laughs> now, by the chuckle in the room, I know that some of you have seen or heard of it. If not, let me give you a brief synopsis. It is somewhat of a spoof off of the classic Western, The Magnificent Seven. But instead of being seven, there are three. And the three, played by Chevy Chase, Martin Short, and Steve Martin, play the most clueless actors that you have ever seen anywhere. You see, the problem is, though, there is a poor, small village in Mexico that is being oppressed and mistreated by an evil man and his gang of thugs. They see a movie that the actors are in and believe them to be true cowboys. And so they reach out to them and invite them to come free their village. Now, the actors believe they are actually being invited not to a gunfight, but to put on a live show in this village in Mexico. So they go down and all kinds of comic mischief ensues along the way. One of my favorite parts of the movie is near the beginning. Before they go to the village, they realize they are going to need their costumes from the studio. So they break in to steal them. 
In order to do so, Steve Martin's character climbs upon a wall that's about 10 feet high to make sure the coast is clear for the other two that are underneath him on the ground. In order to remain clandestine and undetected, to get their attention, he begins to try to use bird noises. It does not get their attention at all. And so he gets louder and louder and louder, completely undoing the purpose of using the bird noises in the first place. And all of this is to no avail. They never look up. Do you know how he finally solved the problems or the problem? He looks at them and out of frustration yells, Hey, you guys! And they look up. He had to use words. The only way he could clear the confusion is to use language. I would tell you one of the ways that we prove we have been created by God is that we use words. The most observable way that the image of God is seen in us is that we talk. Why do I say that? Because God himself speaks. But the question for us is, but what does his word, what does his wisdom say about us using the power of our words to most be like him? Isn't it interesting that Jesus himself in places like John chapter 1 is called the word? One of my mentors said, in Jesus, God has done and said perfectly everything he intended to say to humanity. And here's what I believe. If you are redeemed by him, you will be humble enough to allow him, watch me, to become your speechwriter for the rest of your life. Friend, my question for you today is, to Christ, are you willing to yield your words to refresh and redeem, to serve God and build his kingdom? Would you pray with me this morning? For just a moment as we wrap up today and go into our invitation, I know in a room this large that sometimes the moment or our emotions can get the best of us and we can misuse our words. And even in that moment, we need to yield that back to the Lord, and we need to ask for His forgiveness and guidance. But I wonder if any of you out there are doing self-assessment, and you're just saying, you know what? My words are usually out of control, and they're not helpful. They hurt me, and they hurt others. And maybe right now you're saying, the reason that is is because I've come to understand that I have never yielded my words to Christ because I've never been redeemed by Him. His Spirit isn't in me. Well, I would love to talk with you and pray with you about how you can come to know Jesus as your Savior so that even your words might be used by Him. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we over and over again learn how, how deep of a theological God you are. But God, we also are reminded each and every week through this series how practical of a God you are. There is no part of our life that you don't care about and that you don't want given over to you. And this includes our words, the use of our tongues. Father, it's my prayer today that if there's someone here today that looks and sees a pattern of their tongue being misused, perhaps they've come to the place where they realize they need to be redeemed by Jesus and give it to him. It is my prayer that today would be the day of salvation for them. Father, for the rest of us, perhaps sometimes, because we're not yielding our walk to the Spirit, that today we would understand that we need to give our words as believers over to you so that we'll honor you with our lips and our lives and our hearts will be near to you. Make us servants of yours and make us servants of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we give you these things and pray. Amen. Would you stand this morning and would you come as we sing? Hymn number 591, Purer in Heart of God.
Right, if you have any questions and would like to talk to a pastor, uh, we'll be available after the service, or you can text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322. Also, if this is one of your first times worshiping with us, and you haven't yet had a chance to meet Pastor Adam, he would love to meet you, help you get more connected with First Baptist. He'll be right over here in our hospitality room after the service. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, so we have our new member slides from our members who joined last month. They'll be showing on the screen as we dismiss today, so you'll want to uh, learn some new names and faces. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today for this opportunity to worship and to hear from your word. We thank you for Pastor Adam and his study and preparations, Lord. Help us to live in light of the truth of your word, that we would read it and hear it and apply it to our lives, Lord. We would strive to be, be living holy lives for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 